Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation's virtual town hall, Managing Stress in Times That Retraumatize. My name is Kathy Riley. I'm Vice President of Family Support for the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation and the mother of Peter, who's a young man who was diagnosed with a brain tumor many years ago. And we are truly honored to have all of you joining us today for this important town hall. We'll be hearing from Nikki Yerbergs and Tara Brinkman from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. But before I introduce our speakers to you today, I have a few housekeeping items that I want to review. Uh, Number one, we ask that you keep your video cameras turned off uh, for the town hall so that we're able to see our speakers. Um, you are muted by us for the town hall, but we want you to know we welcome your questions uh, during the presentation and after the presentation. So please type your questions into the chat box that's found at the bottom of the Zoom window. We won't be able to get to every question today, but we'll try to get to as many um, of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Dr. Nikki Yerbergs is a pediatric psychologist who serves as director of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital Psychology Clinic. The psychology clinic at St. Jude works with patients and families to identify and relieve common problems that may arise during treatment. Dr. Yerbergs, who specializes in working with children with brain tumors, has an in-depth knowledge on how to have conversations with kids who have life-threatening conditions. And she regularly advises parents on how to best support their children. Dr. Tara Brinkman is a licensed and psychologist and an associate member in the Department of Epidemiology and Cancer Control and Psychology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Dr. Brinkman's research focuses on neurobehavioral outcomes in survivors of pediatric cancer. She has over 80 peer-reviewed publications related to childhood cancer survivorship Dr. Brinkman has a special interest in the cognitive, social, and emotional outcomes among survivors of pediatric brain tumors. And I am so happy to welcome Dr. Yerbergs and Dr. Brinkman to this town hall. Thank you guys so much for um, joining us. And thank you, Kathy, for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm Nikki, and I'm gonna take the lead on walking us through some, some thoughts here, some slides, and then together, Tara and I are going to answer some questions for you guys. And I'll be honest, this is my first virtual presentation like this, and I uh, really miss being able to see your faces and see the, um, your reactions, and, and it's gonna be a little bit harder for me to Feel like I'm really connecting with you guys so uh, I'm just going to do my best and hope that this is meaningful for everyone. So today we're going to talk just briefly about post-traumatic stress, PTS, just, just briefly introduce what it is, but more importantly I'd like us to spend our time talking about how to cope with current stress not only in the uh, pandemic that we're all experiencing, but in the context of also dealing with either a, a current or history of a brain tumor. And of course, the, the pandemic is, is complicating that for all of us. And a, a, a brief disclaimer, um, Tara and I are not experts on post-traumatic stress, PTSD, but like Kathy so graciously mentioned, we, we have spent our careers working with patients and families with uh, brain tumors, history of brain tumor survivors. So that's, that's a little bit more of our, of our bread and butter here. So thank you, Kathy. Let's move on to, the, to our slides here. Okay, 
So post-traumatic stress, PTS for short, these are of course symptoms of anxiety that occur in response to a specific traumatic stressor. Now in the uh, DSM, that's sort of our diagnostic and statistical, sort of our diagnostic manual in, in psychology and psychiatry, the, the criteria just define stressor as exposure to actual or threatened, I think that's important, death or serious injury or something of that nature. And I think you all will be very interested to learn that in 1994, learning that one's child has a life-threatening illness was officially added as an, an event that could potentially qualify as a, as a traumatic stressor. So again, just briefly, the symptoms of post-traumatic stress fall into three general categories or buckets. Intrusion includes intrusive thoughts, nightmares, flashbacks. You've heard of uh, symptoms like this. Avoidance might include avoidance of people or places or certain activities that remind you of the stressor or the trauma. And hyperarousal includes hypervigilance. So this is sort of like the increased uh, startle response, exaggerated startle response. Uh, it can also include trouble concentrating and difficulty with sleep or sleep disturbance. Kathy, I'm ready. And I want to spend just a moment distinguishing post-traumatic stress from post-traumatic stress disorder. So the disorder itself has more stringent, more specific criteria, perhaps the most uh, important of which is the impairment in functioning. So post-traumatic stress might just be some symptoms. We all might have some symptoms of, of uh, re-experiencing or worrying about a trauma for our past, but disorder requires that the symptoms are very intense, have lasted a certain amount of time, and again, most importantly, that they really keep us from doing what it is we need to do to get through daily life. I am always happy to share the good news that post-traumatic stress nor post-traumatic stress disorder are more common in our pediatric brain tumor patients or survivors. Similarly, these things are not more common in parents of these patients and these survivors. And there is one caveat that some research has found that uh, these symptoms actually are more common in parents with children who have experienced a relapse, which is understandable. And I, I want to really express to you guys that I share this good news uh, not to invalidate the very difficult experience that a brain tumor diagnosis and treatment and ongoing uh, survivorship issues, not to invalidate the experience of how difficult that is, and not to tell you that you aren't experiencing or won't experience difficulties related to that. I just really, I say it more to highlight the good news that you are so resilient, and that in spite of these difficulties, you really, in most cases, patients and families are able to recover, and in some cases, come out stronger. Kathy? And just as a reminder, the P is for post. So post meaning after. When we talk about post-traumatic stress, it's different from the anxiety related to current stressors. So if you are currently dealing with a new brain tumor diagnosis or currently going through treatment or even currently dealing with ongoing late effects of treatment that you know the the distinction being one's going on now and the other is something that happened in the past because again uh patients and, and parents of patients on therapy are are likely to experience stress and anxiety Tara and I were talking just a moment ago, 
if you are not experiencing some level of anxiety, I mean, that would, that would be a shock. <laughs> that would be maybe potentially even concerning. So again, just to normalize this. And, and another piece of good news that I wanna share is, although this is of course a potentially traumatic experience, not all outcomes that families report to us are negative. So over the years, uh, families that, that Tara and I have worked with will, will share stories of the silver lining that the literature has termed this post-traumatic growth, or in some cases, benefit finding. And we hear examples like, even though going through this was very difficult, it brought our family closer together, or this experience gave me an increased understanding of what's important in life, things like that. So again, not to take away from the, the difficulty, but to sort of comment that stress, sadness, grief, difficulty can exist in the same place as positive things like growth and hope and um, you know, it's not a one or the other thing. It's, um, so there is sometimes a silver lining to be found. Kathy. Okay, so here we are in the midst of this pandemic. This is all of us, not just families dealing with a brain tumor diagnosis. We are all worried about our jobs, finances, health, of course, school closings, our families, getting groceries, things like this. I know I'm stressed, I know I'm worried. Uh, I can only imagine that these, these worries are exponentially compounded by the experience of a current or recent or ongoing uh, brain tumor diagnosis. In fact, Kathy, if you'll share the next slide, this is just off the top of my head trying to think of some of the things that depending on where in the cancer experience you and your family are, you're probably worrying even more about job security, even more about social isolation. Uh, will this interrupt the treatment my child is getting? Is my child at increased vulnerability, risk, worrying also about a new diagnosis, prognosis, side effects, late effects, uh, competing responsibilities, taking care of your healthy children um, while, while all of this is going on. Let's go to the next one. So again, <laughs> to review the bad news, so much is out of your control. But the good news is there are some things that are still in your control, believe it or not. So let's think about those things. Kathy, on the next slide. Okay, here are some things that you, whether you feel like you do or not, have some control over. Your thoughts, they might escape you sometimes, but you do have control over what you're thinking, how you were thinking about things, your behaviors, you know, how you're spending your time, what you're doing, talking about time, time spent worrying, believe it or not, you, can, you have some control over that. Gratitude. You have some uh, control over the practice of gratitude and incorporating that. And in a moment, we're gonna talk a little bit more about diet and exercise and the importance of staying connected, even though currently that means connecting virtually with your supports. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Okay, the five pillars of health. This is um, sort of a widely known um, conceptual framework for taking care of yourself and keeping your physical and emotional health in as good a shape as possible, which is always important, but it is increasingly important during times of extreme stress. And again, these are some of the things that you have a little more control over versus the many things that we don't have control over right now. So the things that you and your family can be, should be prioritizing right now include sleep, nutrition, exercise, social support, again, whether that's virtual connections or however you're staying connected, and completing daily activities, which we'll, we'll talk a bit more about in just a moment. I, I want to 
um, I think that probably there are a lot of parents on this on this call with us. Parents, I know that um, to be a parent is to live in a near perpetual state of guilt and um, constantly focusing on your child and what you should be doing for your child. But I, I want to stress here that it is really important that you take care of yourself in order to take care of your child. Making your health a priority now, in the future, anytime, any circumstances is not a selfish thing and you do it in service to your family. So please, please, please remember that as we talk. I want you to be focused not just on how you're taking care of your children, your partners. I want you to be thinking about how you're taking care of yourself too. Okay, let's go on to the next slide and talk a little bit more about uh, routines. There are a number of reasons that maintaining routines and schedules is so important. For one, it's reassuring, right? The sun rises, the sun sets. I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth, I make my bed. Whatever it is, it's sort of reassuring, almost like a, um, a you know, symbolic practice. And, and it helps us know what to expect. It helps us, again, exercise the control over the things that we do have. And there are a number of things that we can incorporate into routines and schedules. So healthy behaviors, we talked about the, the pillars of health. And I want you to be thinking about ways that you can sort of maintain meals and sleep routines and exercise into your daily schedules. Social activities, again, very important to stay connected in this particularly isolating time. And again, I, I keep thinking about you guys who, who are, who've been through or are going through treatment for cancer, you, you're like the experts at social distancing. You know, we're the ones who are late to your party now. Um, but, but again, a sort of a double isolating time for many. Think about scheduling social activities. Can you schedule phone calls or Zoom meetings? Schedule times to sit down as a family and interact with each other and play board games. And then even leisure activities, I think it's important to schedule. We are all so busy trying to manage, you know, many of us are working from home while also trying to teach our kids homeschool, things like this. And, and it's very hectic and to remember that you need to plan time for some leisure activity. Now that's for you parents, for, for patients, for survivors, whether that's you know quiet independent activities or things that you guys do together. I think it's all very important. And let me say also acknowledge that for those of you currently on therapy for a brain tumor, I know that there's so much you can't do to, ske to schedule that routines are very disrupted by the whole, the whole cancer experience, but as much as you can maintain these things. Okay, Kathy. Okay, so a lot of what we do uh, in terms of managing stress or coping with stress during these difficult times are sort of prophylactic in nature. You know, the, the things we've talked about, you know, taking care of your health and keeping routines and exercises. Those are sort of like how to manage your environment in hopes of minimizing stress. However, we're going to have some difficult moments. Like it, it, we all do and, and it's going to happen and we need to have some tools for more like crisis moments, you know. In a second, I'm going to run you guys through a, a to a grounding and a breathing exercise just very briefly. But I also want to mention that if you find that you are having trouble getting through your day, completing your daily activities, taking care of yourself, if you find that your stress or your worries are impacting your relationships, your ability to complete work assignments, it might be that we have sort of gone past uh, self-managing stress and distress, and it might be that it's worth seeking some uh, counseling 
Many mental health providers these days are offering telehealth options, which is great, obviously in the context of the pandemic, but also in the context of parents who are trying to manage multiple medical visits and things like that for their children. I think it's really wonderful that there are more sort of mobile or portable options for mental health treatment these days. So if we, I think on the next slide is our grounding exercise. Forgive me. So mindful, mindfulness exercises that are meant to sort of the, the broader concept, and this is a whole nother, this is a whole nother Zoom meeting for you guys, um, are meant to increase our awareness of what we are experiencing with the ultimate goal of being able to better control our experience. So grounding exercises in particular are meant to ground us in the present moment. So we've all had the experience of racing thoughts or something so challenging or so unbearable that we feel overwhelmed. We feel like we cannot get a grip on um, what's racing through our minds. So one thing that is helpful to, to some, and you know, everybody is, is different. So I'm gonna present a few options and there are many more out there. These are just some examples. So give it a try, but also be open to trying some other ones. So in the grounding exercise, you're going to try to grab a moment of, of quiet, a moment of peace, although wherever you are is fine. And you're going to think about what you are sensing what you are noticing in your environment. So five, four, three, two, one. Five things that you see. I'm sitting here in my office. I see my calendar on the wall. I see my computer screens. I see my hands folded in my lap. Then four things that you feel. I feel that my mouth is dry from talking too much. I feel the chair underneath me. I feel my lumbar support things that you hear. I'm hearing the gentle hum of the air conditioner over me. I'm hearing the slow buzz of my computer fan and smell. And then one good thing about yourself. What's one good thing that, that you can comment on? I can get through this. Or at least I am uh, focusing on my child right now. What, you know, one good thing that you can say in this moment. Let's see. All right, let's go on. Let's try the breathing exercise next, I think. Okay, so again, this is, uh, breathing exercises are great and they can be used along with a number of other mindfulness and related relaxation exercises in a million different contexts. When you're having trouble sleeping uh, to deal with pain, to try to calm your worries or anxieties when you're having racing thoughts, you name it. This is just a very short, uh, brief one. And this is, breathing exercises are best, best, um, they're, they're more helpful, I guess, if you practice them often, just like anything else. The more you practice, the better you're gonna get at this. And so practicing, getting comfortable, Again, if you have a quiet moment, that's great. If there's a million things going on around you, that's okay too. Bringing attention to your breath. Again, this is sort of a mindfulness thing. You're thinking about yourself. You're turning your thoughts inward rather than what's going on around you. Inhale deeply in through your nose as you slowly count to three. Pause and hold your breath for a count of two and then exhale completely through your mouth. I wrote making a whoosh sound, but you don't have to do that if that makes you feel uncomfortable. You can just breathe out your mouth as you count to four. And you do this over and over, and you can actually feel your breath uh, slowing and deepening, which brings oxygen all through your body, which helps you think clearer helps you move forward and is a very easily accessible, you can do it anytime. No one has to know that you stopped what you're doing to do a little breathing exercise. 
Let's see, we'll see what's next, Kathy. Okay, great. At the end of our slide, our, uh, or at the end of the slide deck with Kathy, which Kathy is going to share with you guys, are a number of resources. I hope not resource overload, but here are a few of my favorites. You guys are familiar with the PBTF Family Resource Center, which is really great. I checked it out. I like it very much. I also want to mention Together. This is a website that was put together by St. Jude, but it is not exclusively for St. Jude patients. It is for anybody dealing with pediatric cancer at any stage in the experience. So this is for patients, survivors, families, siblings. This is for teachers who have a patient who survived cancer or who are going through cancer. This is for medical professionals. This is for young adults and kids. And there's so many great resources there. In particular, related to our current pandemic, there are, uh, there's a coloring book, an activity book, and some information sheets about talking to your child about COVID-19 and some related things that I'd love for you guys to check out. And um, a plug for apps. There's a million apps out there. These are a few of my favorites here, Headspace and Waking Up. As always, there's sort of a, a stripped down free version. If you like what you see, you can always, you know, upgrade to, you know, for a small fee. These are, these are apps that have things like our breathing exercises, our grounding exercises, some other meditations, uh, gratitude practices, things like that. Things that are sort of general coping tools for stress but again, also good for more specific concerns like pain, difficulty sleeping, nausea, other symptoms associated with cancer treatment or, uh, or that our survivors or that families caring for these patients might experience. And again, resources are available at the end of our deck. Okay. I want to say something briefly about resilience, which is defined a couple of ways, the capacity to recover from difficulties, the ability to return to the original shape after being pulled, stretched, pressed, and bent. And I don't know that we actually return to our original shape after experiencing something like a brain tumor or a loved one with a brain tumor. I think that um, consistent with what uh, famous philosopher Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. I actually think that in many cases we, we come back stronger. Next, please. So to that end, I want you all to remember how resilient you and your family are. You've been through a lot. I want you to call upon the strengths and the coping skills that you've used successfully to get through the challenging times that you have been through as a family related to the brain tumor experience or otherwise. And again, remember the things that you are in control of and use the tools that are helpful to you. And thank you. And I hope it was helpful. And Tara and I are so happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Nikki. And, um, and I know Tara will be joining us for questions. So I, I want to open it up now for questions. I know that we've been receiving questions from some of you um, already. But uh, we really want to hear from you and engage with you. So please type any questions you have in the chat box at the bottom of the Zoom window. I've already received some questions. And so I will begin with those. And as we receive your questions, we'll get to as many um, as we're able to. Um, so what what are some effective ways that we can encourage families to reach out for support if there are cultural differences that rise for some families 
that may not believe in, in counseling? What are some other effective ways that we can encourage them to reach out for support? That is, go ahead, Tara. No, okay. you're fine. no my mouth is, is, is totally dry from all this talking. Spare um, me for myself. Yeah, I'll start and you jump in. I think, um, I think that's a very important question. I think um, anytime we talk about mental health treatment or counseling, we have to think about sort of the cultural perspective that people bring into that and that some families find it much more acceptable than others for a various number of reasons, including sort of stigma related to mental health care. Um, there's issues related to cost, accessibility, all kinds of factors that play into it. Um, I think there's, I think thinking about the cultural community from which the person comes. So there are some families who may be resistant to traditional mental health services, but perhaps they're particularly invested in their church community and there might be support through the church. Um, and I think um, telehealth, as Nikki mentioned, is really up and coming right now during this pandemic. And a lot of people who have a stigma associated with mental health care, that telehealth perspective seems to, to reduce some of that as well. I also think um, it's a very fair point that, um, that getting advice from a mental health provider isn't you know, always that well accepted by some families. And sometimes actually working with the, the primary physician or oncologist of the patient to have the oncologist also um, put a recommendation in or, or provide some supportive care um, can be helpful as well because sometimes just hearing it from the treating physician carries a certain level of weight that it may not, may not get from like a psychologist or a counselor. Nikki, I don't know if you have other thoughts. No? Okay. Yeah. It's a great question. It's an important point. We, we struggle with it and think about it all the yeah. time. We have families from different cultural backgrounds and we can say one thing to one family and it's very well received and it's off-putting to another family. So I think cultural sensitivity is, is particularly important during this time. Yes. Uh, we have another uh, question is that we, we talked a lot about the, um, the stresses um, of our brain tumor experience and the stresses of today. And one question we received is how do I turn my anxiety into something positive? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, that's um, also a good question. And Tara and I talked about this a moment ago. Um, to turn to turn the anxiety itself into something positive sounds tricky to me. To redirect the anxiety or the energy being gobbled up by the anxiety to to something um, more productive maybe sound that sounds to me a little more feasible, a little more doable. Um, some some practical ways to do that, and this, this might be um, a little bit silly, but, you know, some, a lot of anxiety gives us sort of this, this nervous energy, this like, oh, I feel like I need to do something, and we've heard families doing actually a lot of really interesting things like making masks to share, or uh, writing cards and thank you notes to healthcare providers during this difficult time. Not that that changes the anxiety so much, but it does give you somewhere to direct that uh, nervous energy um, sometimes. Uh, Tara and I also were talking about um, there, the, the concept of acceptance rather than fighting your anxiety or trying to make your anxiety go away, sort of accepting, I am anxious, I have anxiety, not, not, to, not to try to change it, but to sort of uh, accept it and instead try to redirect it and better manage it. Of course, we can do things, you know, again, if there's nervous energy, that's a good time to return to your five pillars of health. Can you use your anxiety to cook an extra healthful meal for your family or go on a walk or find some other way to more productively blow off some steam? Again, not that that takes away your worries, but, but trying to, to do something useful or, or more productive with that energy. 
Yeah, I completely agree, Nikki. I think redirecting it, it, it's a great point. And I think, you know, recognizing, acknowledging, accepting that you're anxious. And, and again, I think one of the messages that Nikki and I want to send to you all is, it's okay to feel anxious during this time. This is a stressful time for all of us. Um, so having that anxiety, that uncertainty, the worry, it's okay to have that. It's about, it's about managing it as effectively as you can to help you get through these days. And that's sort of the, the key that we want to focus on. Okay, we have another um, important question that we just received. Uh, my son is worried his tumor is growing. How do I differentiate between COVID anxiety or real signs of tumor growing? Um, an example would be headache, um, fatigue, uh, less physical activity. So, one thing that I know as psychologists, we always find particularly challenging is when people express fears that are reasonable fears. When someone tells us that they're worried about something that we know is not going to happen, we can sort of challenge that and, and help them change the way they think about that. But to be worried about a tumor recurrence or progression and to be worried about COVID, which is very real, those are reasonable worries. And so you're right, we don't, we don't want to um, assign one to the other. We don't want to overlook something. Of course, the medical team is, is you know, that's your resource for, is there a reason to be concerned about uh, progression, you know, based on symptoms or whatever. And, and depending on what the situation is, hopefully you can get some reassurance from the medical team that this is not tumor progression, for example, you know, if, if we're so lucky that we can get that. And then, and then we're able to, to uh, focus instead on, you know, well, what else is it that might be going on? What else is it that might be making you nervous? And what are some other reasons that we might have headaches or, or other symptoms or experiences? Tara? No, I agree. I think, um, I think if you're able to get that reassurance from the medical team, that, that would be a huge step in terms of, of reassuring your son. Um, and also, we know a lot of times anxiety, we call it somatization, right? When we see physical complaints that are associated with underlying emotional distress. So those go hand in hand all of the time. But I think creating a safe place where your son can talk to you about the worries, um, validating and normalizing worries ab about both tumor recurrence and COVID, because as Nikki said, they're both very real worries um, that should be validated. But again, I think the, the big reassurance coming from whatever surveillance program your medical team has set up in terms of diagnostic imaging and things of that nature to, to hopefully find that reassurance that actually we don't need to be worried about tumor progression right now. Um, so that similar to what Nikki said, yeah. We've also um, had some comments at registration um, about at diagnosis and thereafter having to adjust to what is called a new normal and the onset of a pandemic now has created this um, uh, feeling that there now there is an additional new normal and so a question is 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 how do i do that how do i get um to another new normal out of the new normal that was created post-diagnosis? So I, I've heard the same from, from families that, that I work with here. And I think one, one thing we can do is reflect on how we adjusted to the new normal of, of the brain tumor. How did we, what, what supports what skills, what strengths did we call upon? What were the things that will help, were helpful to us? Was it social support? Was it information from the medical team? Was it developing a routine? Was it uh, reading and finding out information that makes us feel empowered? Was it um, 
not reading everything on the internet, right? <laughs> some some of these different things. So sort of remembering what how did I how did I adjust to new normal new normal the first time? And again, going back to remembering what it is we do have control over, what what things from your brain tumor new normal can translate to your brain tumor plus pandemic oh, new normal. Um, you know, re reminding yourself of the things that are the same. You're still an, a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister, whatever the case may be. You're still in this family unit. The, you still have the same values. You guys as a family still have the same priorities. Trying to remember, remember some of those things. And again, I know I sound like a broken record now, but as you are able, trying to develop new routines and maybe part of those routines is developing new um new little uh habits or traditions things to to mark your new new normal as not an all negative thing and i i would add to that i think those are great points nikki and as odd as this may sound i think you all are a group that might have a skill set that places you at an advantage, right? Because you've adapted to a new normal once and you've done it successfully. And as Nikki said, taking what you learned from that initial experience of adapting to the normal of having a child with a brain tumor and learning what worked for you and applying it again to another new normal. So I think um, the resilience that Nikki brought up in the past, you guys have, you've done this before, you've done it successfully before and, and knowing that you can do it again, even though it still feels uncertain and anxiety provoking. Thank you. That's that's really great. Um, we've had another uh, question from a parent. Um, how can we talk with our friends and help them understand why we as family members or survivors have greater difficulty with the fear or stress of the pandemic? I ask because I am sometimes almost embarrassed by my high levels of anxiety and would like my friends to understand why. Yeah, I can start Nikki and I'd like you to jump in. Um, I think um, my initial thought is that, that this is challenging and perhaps to go back to, to what Nikki said about what you have control over and what you don't have control over. And I think it certainly can be helpful to try to explain to your friends what your feelings are, why you're having increased anxiety. But part of what you may have to accept is that they may just not ever fully appreciate why you have that increased anxiety. And that's okay, that um, those feelings of embarrassment, give yourself some grace. Um, I don't think you need to feel embarrassed that you have heightened anxiety. I think there are a lot of people, most people on this call probably appreciate your heightened anxiety. Um, and just because other people can't doesn't mean that it's not genuine or isn't appropriate. Um, and so just recognizing what you can control and you can't control because sometimes as much as you try to explain something to someone, try to get them to see your perspective or your feelings, it just unfortunately isn't gonna happen. Um, Nikki, do you have anything, other thoughts related to that? Yeah, I just, uh, just like you're saying, Tara, and, and, and thank you for your question, because a lot of times, you know, before the pandemic, just in the context of having a child going through treatment, I've, I've heard parents sort of wrestle with you know, friends, they, they, she just doesn't get it, or he just doesn't get it. And, and I, I think this is sort of another example of the, the difficulty that you encountered as a, as a family going through a brain tumor is now being compounded by, you know, by, by this as well. And not, not that that brings you any, um, my, my answer is not helpful. <laughs> I'm just validating you. And, um, and letting you know that you are absolutely not alone. That's um, a, a song we hear all the time that, that people who are not in this with you really cannot even begin to imagine, even if they want to, even if it's very well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and that uh, I think a lot of times our friends who aren't going through this with us might be very well-intentioned. Maybe they're trying to, oh, you just need to relax or don't worry so much. 
and that maybe that's that's um, invalidating rather than rather than just sort of listening and reflecting with you and and acknowledging that they don't understand, but that um, that a, like Tara said, you are you are well within your right to be doubly concerned at this point. And um, I'm not sure what the answer what the answer is in terms of of uh, trying to help someone understand. Um, you know, you can't know what you what you can't know. We have um, we've talked about um, some parent caregiver anxiety, and we received another question um, related um, to that. Uh, and the question is, how do I keep a teenager motivated um, when anxiety peaks for them? So uh, I can imagine motivated could be related to a number of different things, keeping a teenager motivated to keep up with schoolwork or to take care of themselves or to stay engaged in family life, um, do chores, things, whatnot. Uh, I think that perhaps the first step and is to, again, acknowledge, validate, try to normalize some of the anxiety um, if, if the anxiety seems that it's having this sort of, um, more paralyzing effect, if there is, uh, if, if the teen is experiencing anxiety that is, like we said a moment ago, sort of causing impairment, not just, you know, I'm anxious and this is bothering me and it's sort of complicating my day, but I'm anxious to the point where I can't do the things I need to do. That might be sort of like next level in terms of maybe seeking some more individualized intervention for for managing the uh, the the anxiety. Um, I I have to confess that um, I'm a very behaviorally minded psychologist, and um, a lot of times I go back to basics even with teens. Um, that motivating them, even if the, the, the problem is anxiety, but you know, sometimes motivating them means uh, a, building in some contingency. So, you know, uh, if there's a specific task we need a teen to complete, you're gonna have to complete it before you get your phone back or have access to whatever. And again, I, I mean, I say this with a little bit of caution, not knowing the full story, because if, uh, if someone, if an adolescent is struggling with mood, I also don't want to take away the, the things from them that might, um, might be sort of the only, the only positive things that they're experiencing too. But all, all, all this to say, um, I think it's okay to still have expectations of your children and your teens through all of this. I think that mm -hmm. even if someone um, at any age is so worried that it's making them feel like they don't want to complete whatever the task is, I think, I think it's important for us to say, I understand that you're worried. It's okay to be worried. I'm worried too, but we still have to do our schoolwork or we still have to do our chores or, or whatever those things are. That sort of goes back to the maintaining routines and sort of having the same expectations for your children as you did before cancer, before the pandemic is in a way reassuring to them because if you stop expecting X, Y, Z, that sort of sends the message like, oh, maybe this really is bad. Like mom's not even making me, I don't know, make my bed anymore or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, I might've gone a little too far down the rabbit hole there in terms of um, trying to imagine exactly the scenario. So I, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and we received um, a, a comment and a, and a question that um, is, is a little lengthy, but I think it's important to relay to the two of you to, to just get some, get some feedback from you. So if you'll be patient with me as I, as I, as I read through this. Um, it's a, a caregiver saying, I also feel um, high, a higher than normal level of anxiety. Um, predominantly in an almost subtle 
hyperventilation, slight trembling, heart palpitations, not to mention GI disturbances. Mm -hmm. I have tried many ways to alleviate these and they work temporarily, but there always seems to be this underlying feeling of mild panic. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the mechanics or physiology of this? It may help to understand my body and, and why my body and mind are behaving this way. Yeah, I can start on that one, Nikki, if you want to jump in. No, please. Um, you, you were already talking about somatic things, so I think it's perfect. You're ready. Yeah, I opened the door, right? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, usually, it, I don't know if you're familiar with, but we, in, in response to like an acute stressor, we hear of this flight or, or fight response. And really, there's the activation of our sympathetic nervous system. And that's what causes these physiologic symptoms that you're describing. Typically, you'll see these, though, as I mentioned, in response to sort of an acute stressor. Um, if you're seeing these in response to like a chronic stressor or all of the, or all of the time, to me, that indicates you, you might want to think more about talking with someone to learn some behavioral and cognitive strategies to help manage these. I mean, I think it's important to pay attention to sort of what thoughts you're having that, that are happening while you're having this physiologic response. Are you having racing thoughts about you know, something bad happening to you or your child? Um, paying attention to what seems to trigger this. Is it happening at certain types of the day or certain times of the day? Is it after you watch the news related to the pandemic? Is it when your child complains about a headache? So, so being mindful of those types of things. But if you're having repeated and constant physiologic symptoms that are discomforting to you, I, I would think about either talking to your physician or, or talking to someone who can help provide some assistance to better understand sort of the cognitions that are associated with some of these behaviors and physiologic responses. I mean, we, but we clearly know there's a link between what we think, what we feel, how our body responds. So, so what you're describing makes a lot of sense from a physiologic perspective. Um, it's just concerning if it's happening to you a lot and you're, and you're feeling uncomfortable during, during the day and aren't able to alleviate those most of the time. That's when I would think about maybe reaching out. I don't know if you, if you have different thoughts or additional thoughts, Nikki. No, I, I think you described it very well, Tara. Um, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, some of the things that um, you know, you mentioned that you've tried some things and they seem to help for a while. And I can imagine that maybe it's different relaxation activities or breathing activities or, um, uh, you know, going for, you know, distraction type activities, getting engaged in something else. And it's true that those help temporarily, but if, if we're having more of a pervasive particularly just this like underlying, you know, kind of always on the edge of something. I'm with Tara. I think that it might be that, um, uh, that some more individualized um, assessment and feedback for you might be, might be helpful. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And I appreciate you um, pointing us to just paying attention to when those triggers come. I think that is particularly helpful and enlightening um, for us as, um, as caregivers. I, I appreciate that. Um, we have a lot of, of, of questions um, that uh, at registration that were about not feeling um, safe. And I think that is in some ways related to that feeling of anxiety, but mm -hmm. it feels like an un, unsafe time. And so what are, um, maybe explain why we might be feeling that and, and uh, what are some, some, some tips or some suggestions um, that you could provide to us um, during these, these really trying days? So it is, why, uh, this is sort of what we mentioned ago about you you can't tell somebody not to worry about something if it's a legitimate worry and it's you know we've all seen the news and, and seen the guidance and and how how to how to what precautions to follow to protect ourselves from uh, COVID-19 um, that's a real fear 
So if you're feeling like it's an unsafe time, I'm very sad to report that I think it is, I think for all of us. Um, and the, on, the only things, you know, medically, practically, physically, the things we can do to try to keep ourselves safe are the, the precautions that, that we all know about, you know, social distancing and washing hands and wearing masks and minimizing contact and staying home and all of these things, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the way we can try to feel a little more safe about that is slightly different. That's more about reminding yourself what you are doing to be safe. Reminding, well, I'm staying home. I'm not going to work anymore. I'm not going you know, out in public anymore. Re you know, Reminding yourself that you are taking these steps. Again, what are the things that we do have control over? Um, and, and again, it's, we could be having the same talk with parents and families and kids who are otherwise healthy and not experiencing brain tumor or, or other illness. Um, it is, it is a scary time for all of us and we're all feeling, um, very unsettled and unsafe and just reminding, you know, b being informed of what to do following those guidelines and reminding ourselves that we are taking those precautions. And then we, we have about, about four minutes left and I have one, one additional question. So before I ask it, just to make you aware of our, of our time constraints. Um, uh, someone is saying, I feel like my anxiety is actually quite low and I feel like I've been trained since my daughter was diagnosed. I feel everyone else with typical families are having worse anxiety levels than myself. And this could just be the fact that I'm familiar with these feelings or have I just detached over time? Is this normal or maybe a deeper issue? Tara said a moment ago that you guys are, are uniquely equipped to deal with a lot of the uncertainty that the rest of us are experiencing sort of for the first time. and. Um, I, as I commented, what, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And I truly, I, I truly think that this, that is a normal reaction. And I applaud you for recognizing that you have developed these skills, that you have learned how to cope with uncertainty, fear, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't necessarily, like nothing that, that you shared in your question makes me think that there's something wrong or some underlying issue. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing to be coping well during this very difficult time, whatever the reason is. I think it's wonderful. I wish you could bottle it and, and share it with all of us. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Nikki. I think it probably speaks to, to skills you developed that you may not have even been aware of that you developed. And I think it's more of a resilience thing than, than anything being wrong with you. So I, I think it's great. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we need to uh, wrap up and conclude the town hall. And um, Nikki and Tara, do you have any any final thoughts before I close us out? Thank you for having us. I hope it was helpful. Please check out the resources in the slide deck that we're going to share. Yeah, and take care. Yeah, take it day by day. Continue to to keep. Um, be mindful of the things that are in your control and what you can do and, and recognize that feeling anxiety from time to time or worry is, doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. And as Nikki said, I think there's a lot of great resources. So if you do start to feel anxious, some of these, these websites have some good resources on there. Well, I, I want to thank the two of you for uh, giving of your, your time and, 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 your, and your expertise. We, we just, we so appreciate this, this hour that you've spent with us and, and how you've thoughtfully um, presented ways that will help us cope and, and answer our questions. Thank you. And I, I just want to thank all of our attendees. I wish we could have seen each and every one of your, uh, your faces during this time. Uh, please reach out to us at the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation for support uh, at the contact information on this slide. Uh, we'll be posting the recording of the town hall on our website, 
and we'll also send you the slides at the email address you registered with. Uh, but thank you all. Please stay in touch and have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.